working our way towards uh, the prophetic portion in uh, Matthew 24 and 5, which is generally known as the Olivet Discourse. And we'll be uh, dealing with that as soon as we get to it. Now, we want to review this story about the barren fig tree in uh, Matthew 21, beginning with the 18th verse. We uh, took up the details of it last week, and so we need to review it a little and then uh, draw uh, the conclusions together. So we'll be reading now in Matthew 21, verses 18 through 22. Now, in the morning, as he returned into the city, he was a hungered, and when he saw a fig tree along the way, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer believing, ye shall receive. Now we pointed out before that further details of this story are given in the gospel according to Mark. And as is very often the case, Mark is considerably more detailed in his account. And if we were to read it there, we find that the language is such that we can tell that he is also giving the sequence of events. Uh, so we had the triumphal entry, which is, which is generally believed to have been on a Sunday. And then he went on into the uh, temple area, came out that, uh, that evening and went back over to Bethany, which is on the south side of uh, the Mount of Olives, maybe two, two and a half miles or so outside of the east gate of uh, Jerusalem. We'll recall that he didn't spend the nights in Jerusalem, but he went out the east gate uh, usually to his friends there in Bethany, um, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So on Sunday night, we'll say, uh, if, if this sequence of these days as they go along don't quite agree with the way you've learned it, well, don't let it bother you too much. I'm not real sure just how the days went, but uh, assuming, as we uh, do, that the triumph in, triumphal entry uh, was on Sunday, then uh, Monday morning, as they were going back into the temple area, uh, he saw this fig tree that had leaves on it, but no figs. And uh, so the fig tree was cursed, and then they went on in to the temple area, and that's when we, uh, then when he drove out the money changers, as we have recorded in verses 12 through 17. Then uh, probably after dark, they went back to Bethany again, and then it would have been on Tuesday morning when they came back by and saw the tree withered away. <coughs> now we pointed out that several of the words that we have here are used figuratively quite frequently in the Bible. For instance, figs, fig trees, fig leaves uh, are figurative first of Israel in one aspect. And they've come to mean uh, Israel as it made a show of doing God's work and uh, following in his way, but having no fruit to show for it. You'll remember that Israel as a nation was called out of Egypt. They were given special provision, protection, and and sustenance by God as they went through the wilderness uh, journey and then they were given a very special land. It was uh, God's purpose there uh, to teach them his ways that they might take the glad message of a gracious and good God to all the peoples of the world. But they liked their place and they lived like they wanted to and they didn't follow God's directive and uh, so uh, he was not able to accomplish his purpose through them. Uh, he has... Uh, God has uh, declared himself as uh, having a program of doing his work in this world through human agency. And they were the human agents that were selected at that time. So this fig tree having leaves but no fruit is a picture of, of how Israel was in its religious prosperity at the time. They had the, the great temple there. You see, the fig tree... Uh, stands for Israel as Israel is prospering outwardly. Well, they had this working deal with the emperor of Rome and he had let them build this great in art, in, in art, uh, 
ornate. Uh, okay. Uh, built this uh, great ornate building, the temple there, and they were the religious center of the world. And to remember the story of how the eunuch came all the way from down in Central Africa, uh, many, many months of travel, uh, because he knew that that was the uh, chief religious center of the world. So there was a uh, degree in which they were prosperous, having the favor of uh, the powers uh, that were at that time. Uh, but it was an outward prosperity and there was no fruit unto righteousness there. This is what uh, John the Baptist told the religious leaders when they came to him to be baptized. He says, you bring forth fruit that shows forth your repentance and then I'll baptize you. We pointed out that uh, Israel is also uh, represented by the olive tree. And Israel is the olive tree when God is empowering that nation to do his work. Uh, it's uh, showing forth, when that nation is showing forth the power of God, then they're the olive tree. And we're going to find out later in our lesson today that they are also the vine or the vineyard. And they, they are this when they're in fellowship with their God. So each of these uh, figurative trees or, or plants showed some different aspect of Israel in the relationship to God. Fig trees, fig leaves uh, have the connotation of, of having a show of righteousness then, just as it did when uh, Adam and Eve uh, sewed uh, fig leaves together to try to cover up their own evilness. We uh, tend to uh, show forth our, our best side for man to see, but God sees right through fig leaves. And so uh, Christ was saying here, if you're not going to have any figs, well, there's no need to be around, so I'm not going to let you show uh, uh, put forth a show if you're not going to produce the works. Then we found that the word mountain is used figuratively as we find it here in the latter part of the 21st verse. And uh, we went through a number of scriptures last week that show that when the word mountain is used figuratively, it stands for the seat of government. For instance, the place from which God rules is called the Mount of the Lord. You find that in uh, particularly in the prophetic scriptures like uh, in the book of Daniel and in the book of Ezekiel. We found uh, this uh, used quite clearly in that respect, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, and in Daniel chapter 2, uh, verse 25. Then we found that uh, a C, I can't read whether that's verse 25, I put a note here, or 35, I wrote too small. Maybe it's Daniel 2.35. Somebody ought to look it up and find out if somebody else has taken notes. I think it's 2.35. Then uh, we found that the word sea just means that great mass of humanity in all of its turmoil without direction from God. And we find this used in, in this manner, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 16, verse 12. And the Lord used it in such in uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 25. It's very clear that he's equating the turmoil of nations with uh, the turmoil of a restless sea. So if we put, all, put these uh, together, this mountain and the sea, in figurative language, what God is saying is that through the uh, agency of man, through what God is doing, through human agency, that one day uh, it'll be as though a great mountain or a great kingdom uh, will be cast into the sea. Now, we pointed out last week that you actually see this in Revelation 8.8, 8, if you want to turn there at just a moment, and you'll see it's not just something uh, that uh, we make up. But in Romans 8.8, 8, the apostle John sees a vision, uh, and the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. Now, this is a picture of the fact that one time in the future there's going to be a great world kingdom on this earth, but it's going to be brought down. And God's going to use uh, his purposes and his work in this world to bring that down. We, we know it of it as the, as the amalgam, uh, amalgamation of nations under the Antichrist. But this will be the culmination of this. Not, this does not necessarily mean just that one. The one in Revelation means that one. It means that great uh, kingdom that's going to be, uh, rise up under the Antichrist. That mountain, that kingdom, that uh, seat of government is going to be cast into the sea so that it's just a, a part of the turmoil of the world. But this has been happening all through the centuries. For instance, uh, take Hitler's regime. 
uh, it was a great mountain, or Mussolini's regime, or the, the, the Roman Empire, uh, that type of thing. And uh, the, uh, the Roman Empire uh, was, in one sense, tossed into the sea. When, uh, the, the, with the preaching of the apostles, they turned the world upside down in all of its power, no matter how much it might be against what God was doing, and no matter uh, how that government would try to annihilate God's people, still, uh, what God was doing won out. And uh, pretty soon, this great mountain, the Roman Empire, just found itself swallowed up in the sea, in just the great uh, mass of humanity uh, that we have in the world. And what Jesus is saying here, that type of thing can be done by prayer. Now you say, well, doesn't it mean literal? Doesn't it mean that if, if a mountain needed to be literal, literally uh, moved that you could pray and have that mountain uh, removed? Well, I don't know of any record in history where it's ever been done, and there's no scriptural account. Have you uh, seen any story in the scripture? Uh, well, God can do anything, you know, if it needs to be done. That's obviously not what he's speaking of. He's using figurative language here. He's talking about that through uh, the efforts of Christian laborers, uh, Christ, through human agency, nations uh, will be pulled down. This is why the prophet Daniel tells us that all the nations of the world, in one sense, are in the hand of God. He never lets his overall purpose be thwarted. Now you say, well, then why does he let the North Vietnamese, with all of their help from the communist countries, overthrow uh, that uh, other poor little country down there? Why does he permit that? Well, uh, you can be sure of this, that they couldn't do it if he didn't want them to, or if he didn't permit it. Uh, but he said a long time ago, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And God's not particularly interested in preserving one godless government against another godless government. Uh, although we might think that uh, we might favor one instead of the other. Neither one of those two governments uh, calls upon the name of God uh, for their uh, help and survivorship, do they? And uh, that's a good warning to us because we don't do much of that ourselves, do we, uh, anymore. But our nation was founded on that basis. Now let's look at this, uh, this verse 22. In all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Now let's just ask a question. When the Bible says all here, does it mean all? All things? You mean whatsoever I'd really believe that God would do if I'd pray about it, would he do it? A-L-L -L all. That kind of all? Now, that's what the word means here. And he doesn't intend for us to shrink it down. But this is what he does intend. He intends for us to interpret this verse in the light of all the other verses in the Bible on the same subject. And that's what we're going to do. In other words, God is saying, in view of all I've said about praying in faith and believing... I make this statement, and I mean it just like it is. All right, just let's, let's just look. He, he makes a qualification. He says, all things whatsoever ye ask in prayer believing. Then let's turn next to uh, uh, the Gospel of John. Now, uh, if you have a hard time finding your place, you might want to hold your finger in Matthew 21. We're going to be back there, but we're going to take a little journey before we get back. So we start out in John 14. John 14 verse 13, and you'll see another qualification here. You see one there? John 14, verse 13. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if ye ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, God has a purpose on earth today, and that's the glorification of his Son through human agency. And if what you're praying for works into that program, whatever you pray will, uh, will, be, uh, will be answered. Because it's impossible to pray anything in the name of Jesus Christ against God's will because Jesus said when he was here, I do always those things which please the Father. And he has the same mind today. And as he operates through us, that's his same mind. 
And so, to ask for something in his name is to ask for something uh, in view of what he's doing in the world today. Or it's not in his name. What God's program in the world today. What is God's program? God's program is calling out a people for his name. So you see, uh, this is another qualification. Pray and be pray believing and ask in his name. Now, we'll get some uh, further backup on that. Uh, we'll get another uh, qualification or two in chapter 15 of John, verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done for you. Now, this uh, first, this abiding in him is uh, akin to asking in his name. Because if I'm abiding in him, uh, then I will be asking in his name. To ask outside of his name or ask outside of what his mind would be. And his mind was, I do always these things which please the Father. If, if to ask outside of that would be not to be abiding in him, wouldn't it? And then it says, if my words abide in you. That is to say, you may want to please the Father, but you don't know what the word of the Father is. You just haven't been that diligent in searching out the word and finding out what, what God has in mind. And so, if you ask in his name, if you believe, and if you're abiding in him and his word's abiding in you, whatever you ask will be done. Now, he says this quite a few times about in my name. Notice in verse 16 of this same uh, chapter 15. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name, he may give it. And then uh, on over to uh, chapter 16 of John, verse 23. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto, if ye ask nothing in my name, ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. He wants us to ask because this lends to our enjoyment. You see, when I go to God and pray for something, somebody says, well, if God already knows what he's going to give you and it's just going to be what he wills, what's he used to praying? Well, you see, when I pray for something and I feel a deep burden, to pray for something and I pray diligently for it and then I see it happen I just well over with joy and God wants me to be joyful and so he, he he answers the prayer so that my joy might be full so he wants me to ask what's his purpose in wanting me to ask so I'll bubble you know that's what joy is joy is peace that bubbles joy is effervescent peace you know everybody knows what peace is well sometimes peace just sort of bubbles over well that's joy all comes from within Happiness comes from without, you see. it. Happiness depends upon happenings, uh, circumstances, the things around us. But joy is a gift of God from within. It's that peace that just sometimes won't contain itself. And it just has to manifest itself. Peace manifests itself in joy. And so the Lord says, I want you to have some joy. You know the way to get joy? Is to ask me things. In the Father's name. You see, when I ask and it, and it comes right back from God, I says, oh, isn't this wonderful? I must be asking in his will. I must be asking in his name. I must be really on the right, isn't this great? You know, that's, uh, that's the purpose of it. That's what Jesus is talking about. Okay, hold our place. I mean, no, we can leave John now and go to 1 John. Way over near the back of our Bibles in the book of 1 John. You see, it's, it's a matter of finding out all that God said. How could God expect less than this? He lets every Christian know that this is his word to the extent that we want to know it. We can know. You see, if any man wills to do the will of the Father, he shall know of the teaching, whether it be of God. John seven seventeen. We can know. So... How could God assume anything else that if we knew that this is his word that we wouldn't spend all the necessary time to find out what God says? How could God possibly assume that we'd spend three hours a day watching TV and 15 minutes a day trying to find out what he said? He can't assume that. 
because that just doesn't even make sense. That's just completely unreasonable for God to have spoken, and then I uh, spend more time on what man wants to get across and the world system wants to get across than, than I do on what God wants to get across. So God has a right, doesn't he, to assume that I have carefully studied and acquainted with myself with everything that he has to say on a particular subject. So then, when he says something, I'm not to just take that one place where he says that part of it. I'm supposed to take that in the light of all else that he said on that same subject, and that's what we're doing. So we can come out with a right conclusion. So 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. We have a very similar uh, passage here. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments number one and do those things which are pleasing in his sight now let's take this down there's two things first we keep his commandments that, that, that's not, that doesn't mean the ten commandments that God wrote for Moses upon Mount Sinai that's not what it's talking about the commandments he's talking about are carefully described for us in the next verse see and this is his commandment see he didn't want to leave you wondering here he he said something about commandments over there in uh, Exodus and in Deuteronomy and he's saying something about commandments here so he wants to be sure that you know what commandments he's talking about and here's here it is and this is his commandment number one that we should believe on the name of the son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave commandments you see, the commandments were all summed up. Jesus summed them up several times by saying, The first and great commandment is this, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind. That's the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, there's no way in the world that you can even come close to measuring up to that first one. There's no way you can love God with all your heart so that it will uh, meet, uh, properly meet with God's measuring stick. Jesus did that for you. And your love for God manifests itself as you yield yourself to Jesus. Now, if you're trying to love God as much as he loves you, you're going to end up by being an awfully frustrated human being. You'll never do it. The only chance of your coming anywhere close to manifesting the kind of love that God is talking about is to yield to the Spirit of Christ that dwells within you. He does love the Father sufficiently, completely. And He will love the Father through you with your emotion and your heart and mind. But you don't have the capacity. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and gave Himself for us. So you see, uh, when Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy mind and with all thy soul, soul, he did that for me. That's why he says here, we should believe on the name of the Son of God. That is, we should trust Jesus for our eternal salvation and for our walk with him. That's how we love the Lord thy God. That's the best we can do towards loving God with all our heart and our soul and our mind. That's number one. Remember, somebody asked, this is back in John chapter 6, somebody asked Jesus, what should we do to work the works of God? You remember what he said? He says, this is the work of God, that you believe on him who he has sent. That's the work of, uh, of God, if you want to do God's work. That's uh, John 6, and I believe 46, right in there somewhere. Who looked up that other one for me? Was it... It, it, it was 2.35, Daniel 2.35. Whoever wrote down do, Daniel 2.25, change your 2 to a 3. Six twenty nine. Okay. Uh, what does that say? Read it for us. Oh. Oh. He that answered that's the verse I want. Thank you. 629. So this is saying the same thing, see? Uh, in in uh, 1 John 3.23, And this is the commandment that we should believe 
on the name of the Son of God and love one another as he gave commandment. Now, you see, that was the, the second part of that. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, you see, we can do this to the acceptability of our fellow human beings. See, one of these loves is towards God. We don't have that capacity. Now, we really can't love our neighbor like God did, but we can love our neighbor uh, sufficiently enough for him to accept it as love because he has the same frame of reference as we do. And uh, uh, so it, it'll come out all right. But if you try to love God like God loves you, you're going to be frustrated. It won't work. But you can yield yourself to that Christ within you who already loves the Father. And the love from within you will be manifested towards God. Now, does that sound too complicated? It really isn't. It's much simpler. The other way will, will, will complicate the thing. Learn how to yield to Jesus. Just realize he already loves God the Father uh, to, the, to the zenith, to the epitome. So you just flow into that love that he already has. You've become one with him. Let his love for the Father be manifested in you. And every now and then you'll say, uh, well, thank God and praise God and stuff like that. And uh, somebody will think you're a little icky and stupid, but he'll just come out. And you won't be able to hold it back, hardly. I even heard uh, Dr. Bob Smith do that a couple of times. And uh, he, he tried to stifle it, but it just comes out anyhow. You see, That's where it works. Okay. Got another one for you. First John chapter 5, verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Now, what we've said is this. Anything that you ask God, he gives you. Anything, without any exception, providing. It's in prayer believing. It's in his name. He's a, you're abiding in him. His word's abiding in you. You're keeping his two commandments we talked about. Uh, and uh, it's your desire to please him. And it's according to his will. And the joy will be yours. If, if you don't quite uh, latch on to that, if you think it's too complicated, I got a good scripture for you. We know not how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself helps our infirmity. You see, anybody know what that is? Romans 8, 26, is it? Uh, we don't know how to pray anyway, see. But the Holy Spirit does, and he dwells within us. And he'll pray the right thing through us. And then our joy will be full. Did I get it right that time? Romans eight twenty six. Okay. My uh, rememberer is not working perfectly tonight. All right. Does that uh, help us? Uh, do we need to answer some questions or something before we go on from this? I don't want to leave anybody with the wrong impression. We're about to go on to the next story. Okay. You had your chance. Matthew twenty one twenty three. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came unto him as he was preaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask uh, you one thing, which if you will tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where was it? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we say from heaven... He will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? They're pretty smart, aren't they? See, they knew that John the Baptist was a message, messenger sent from God. And knowing that, they didn't need to ask him that question because John the Baptist's whole message was, I must decrease and he must increase. He pointed to him and said, This is the one. One time he pointed to him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Another time he pointed to him, he says, This is the Son of God. And he, another time he says, This is the one who the Spirit told me was the anointed of God. This is Jesus the Christ. He pointed him out and said over and over again, That's the authority by which Jesus was pro, uh, proclaiming then. The, the fact 
that man was able to know that the message of John the Baptist was from God. So Jesus asked this. Verse 26, they, they're reasoning now. They say, if we say uh, from men, we fear the people. You know, this uh, account of this story here is also in Mark and in Luke. And in Luke, uh, <laughs> these uh, Pharisees and so, all said, they said, well, the people will stone us. You see, you were supposed to stone someone who held themselves out to be a religious leader but was not a true spokesman. Now, the people knew that John the Baptist was a true, a true spokesman. So if anybody had said John the Baptist was not from God, well, by the commandment of Moses, those people would have necessarily had to stone their own religious leaders. So they said, that's not appetizing to us today. And uh, so we're not going to, uh, to uh, say anything. And if we say from men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Now he's going to uh, give some parables. But what you think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said to the same. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Which of the twain did the will of his father? They say unto him the first. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye when ye had seen, repented not afterwards that ye might believe him. Well, now, this is a very, very simple story. And Jesus is simply telling in parable form what actually happened. He's talking to religious leaders here. He's talking to the people who have held themselves out to be the spokesman of God. Now, by holding themselves out in that manner, they were proclaiming by their words and actions that we uh, obey God. If God says go into the vineyard, we go. Whatever God says, we do. But they didn't. But the publicans and the harlots, they all knew the law. They knew that the law says thou shalt not commit fornication, thou shalt not commit adultery. They knew that the law said uh, that you shouldn't uh, uh, cheat your fellow uh, citizen and th that you shouldn't uh, uh, steal from him. And that's what they were doing. So they knew better than that. So by doing that, they were saying, no, we will not obey God. But then when John the Baptist came and proclaimed the message, then they said, they repented of their sins, and they say, we will. But when the, when the uh, Pharisees and the religious leaders came, and John uh, told them to show forth works meet for repentance, and uh, th they didn't. So see, they knew that this parable was about themselves. They knew that. They're going to say so in, in a few minutes when we get to the next one. So he tells his story. Now, it has to do primarily with the nation of Israel and the difference between those who accepted Christ and those who didn't accept Christ, the individuals in the nation. But you see, it also has to do with the nation of Israel in comparison with uh, the Gentile nations of the world. See, every human being that's ever gone, come into this world in any nation of the world has gone their own way away from God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've strayed away from God from the very womb. We've said no to God, all of us. But you see, Israel as a nation made a show of saying yes to God. That's why they let Herod build that big temple there and everything. But now you see... Israel, as a nation, is on the outside, whereas those from among the nations, this is why uh, James at the uh, council there in Jerusalem is recorded in Acts chapter 15 when he was explaining the program of God. He says that God has set Israel away, aside, and God has a program now. He's calling out a people for his name from among the nations, from among the Gentile nations. And then he goes on to say, and after that, he's going to build again the tabernacles of David, which are fallen down, or build up again the, uh, uh, the authority of the Israel, uh, uh, Israel's nation. 
Now, this vineyard then speaks of Israel as a, a place where people are supposed to do their work. And this is a, a typical language that's used all through the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, for that matter. And it might be well, if we want to hold our place here in Matthew, since we have two parables right in a row here about the vineyard, you're going to have three all together in this uh, series here about the vineyard. And each time Israel is the vineyard. And two of them are right together and then we'll come to another one. Uh, uh, no, we had the other one already uh, in uh, chapter 20. I don't remember. When we were in chapter 20, did we go back and see the 80th Psalm in uh, Isaiah 5 where we came from? Well, you'll have to do it again. I don't remember. Uh, Psalm 80. It will be unmistakable to you that God is talking about Israel here. Psalm 80. This psalm is by Asaph. And Asaph wrote quite a number of the psalms and he was a later writer of the Psalms. You know, many of the Psalms were written much earlier, and David David was the chief writer of the Psalms, but Asaph uh, wrote after uh, Israel had gone into decline and were in the process of being banished out of the land. And it was in this vein that he, uh, uh, that he wrote these Psalms. Look in, the ch in Psalm 80, beginning with the 8th verse. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen or the nations and planted it and prepared room before it and didst cause it to take deep root and it filled the land the hills were covered with the shadow of it and the boughs there, thereof were like the goodly cedars she sent out her boughs under the sea and her branches under the river why hast thou then broken down her hedges so that all they uh, skip page here got a new bible and the pages stick together all they uh, who pass by the way do pluck her. See, the, the, you can see the picture here. Israel came out of Egypt, was planted in this good land, the promised land, and it was very prosperous and so forth until the time came when God dispossessed them or broke down the hedges, so to speak. Okay, Isaiah wrote just after this, and he wrote in the fifth chapter of Isaiah a similar little discourse. And here again, he doesn't leave any doubt at all because he's going to come right out and tell you who he's talking about. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he digged it and gathered out the stones and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press in it. And he looked for it to bring forth grapes. And it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done to it? Wherefore, when I looked for it to bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge. See the same general language. I will take away its hedge and... It shall be eaten up and, and break down its walls and it shall be trodden down and I will lay it waste and it shall not be pruned nor digged but there shall come up briars and thorns speaking of the host of Nebuchadnezzar and so forth and I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it verse 7 for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel that didn't leave us in doubt did it? Now, the, the imagery is here. You remember when God uh, asked the, the Israelites to come into the land, he says, I'm going to give you a land, and it's going to have wells of water that you didn't dig. You're going to drink water from wells you didn't dig. You're going to eat fruit from trees that you didn't plant, and you're going to harvest grain from fields that you didn't cultivate. He says, I prepared this place for you. The reason I've done it is because I want you to understand what a good God that you have so that you can go tell this news to all the peoples of the world. But if you disregard my program and you go your own way and do your own thing, then I'll have to tear up the vineyard because I planted it for a purpose. And by the same token, God has every one of us here for a purpose. And even among Christian people today, 
it's quite popular to do your own thing. I, I'm amazed at how frequently I ask somebody just, just to get a reaction. I said, tell me something. Why do you do so-and-so? Because I want to. That's their only reason. Because I want to. I've got a thing that I want to pursue. And that's what I do. I don't have any regard whatsoever from the fact that God has a purpose for me. I have something I want to do. And that's why I'm doing this. Next time you see somebody doing something foolish, you know, like a foolish habit that tears down your body and does you no good. Just ask them, why do you do that? And say, because I like to. I want to. That's my thing. Yeah. Now, we laugh at that, but I'll tell you what. In God's eyes, that is the very, very grossest of sins. To know down deep in our side, and uh, down deep inside of us, that God, the almighty God has a purpose in our life and then to use our life for our own selves. That's, that's the grossest of sin in God's eyes. All these things that we call sins are just outworkings of that. And this is what Israel was guilty of. Well, we could go over to the next book. It's Jeremiah. And I don't know if I can find the verse, but I know it's in the second chapter. Um, Uh, Jeremiah 2.21 Yet I have planted thee a noble vine holy a right seed how then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me he's talking again about Israel and now we could find several places in uh, Ezekiel uh, he uses this imagery quite frequently uh, I think once in the 15th chapter, another time in maybe the 17th, maybe the 19th, several chapters there that he uses it. And then here's another one you might like to look at in the book of Hosea. Now that comes right after Daniel if you're not familiar with it. Uh, everybody can find Daniel, you know, you've been reading about the lion's den. And uh, right next to that is the prophet Hosea. And he's uh, talking about Israel after they've already been dispossessed. If you can't find it, go to Matthew and subtract 12, and there it is. <laughs> Hosea 10.1, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. See, this is what we've been talking about. That's why I want to turn it. Israel is an empty vine. God planted a vine in a fertile land to produce fruit, didn't he? And what did the vine do? He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars according to the goodness of his land, and so forth. So, is it all right for us to assert that the vine is Israel? Got everybody's agreement on that. No dissenters. Well, we want to at least get into this other parable on the vine that we have in beginning with verse 33 of Matthew 21 and we've kind of considered as we go along here another parable there was a certain householder who planted a vineyard now that was God and he hedged it round about the same language we've had before and he digged a wine press in it now the wine press is there because he expected a harvest uh, and uh, wine in the Bible stands for the joy of the Lord the uh, the uh, relationship between God and man in right relationship. This is, uh, uh, you'd find it one place in Psalm 104 and another scripture in Judges. Now, I'll, I'll see if I can find those for you in a little while. Here another parable. There was a certain householder who planted a vineyard and hedged it about and, and digged a wine press in it and built a tower. That means he watched over it. And he let it out to farmers. That is to say, he left it in the care of somebody else. These would be the rulers, particularly the re religious rulers of Israel. And he went into a far country. He didn't stay there and tend the vineyard himself. He let somebody else tend it. And uh, in the Luke account, it says for a long time. He did this for a long time. Verse 34. Oh, by the way, this uh, parable we're reading now is recorded in Mark and Luke and Matthew. And it's uh, quite uh, unique in that there are very few details given in either one of the accounts that
that is not that is not given in all of the accounts. Usually, you have a number of details added in each of the accounts. Here, uh, the the all the details are given in each of the accounts, with maybe one or two exceptions. Verse 34. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants uh, to the farmers or the husbandmen, and took and and they that they might receive the fruit of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Now this is what they did to the prophets. He's calling these servants that come from the father. He's, uh, he's speaking of the prophets that he sent, like Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and so forth. And they mistreated all of them. Uh, verse 36, again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Right on down the line, you know, he kept sending uh, servants. Uh, uh, later on he sent Hosea, which we had a hard time finding, and then uh, on down the Malachi uh, all the way through. Verse 37, But last of all he sent unto them his son. In the Mark account it says his well-beloved son, saying, They will reverence my son. Now, of course, this speaks of the fact, obviously, that he sent Jesus to Israel. And the Bible tells us that he came unto his own, but his own received him not. See, as the parable goes on here, verse 38, uh, And when the husbandmen saw the son, they said uh, among themselves, This is the heir, come let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. You know, if you read through the, the Gospel of John, it astounds you how many times you're told that they counsel together to see how they might take his life every time he'd do a miracle. And when he, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, they said, let's kill him and Lazarus. Now that takes some brazen disbelief to see a man raised from the dead, that God raised from the dead, and then say, we're going to kill that man that God raised from the dead and the one that raised him from the dead hardly understandable, but we see the same type of thing in the world today. This is the heir. Let's kill him and seize the inheritance. In other words, we want to run things our own way. We don't want to run, run them God's way. We want to run this vineyard like we want to run this vineyard. And the only way we're going to have free uh, latitude to run it like we want to run it is to get rid of whoever claims to be the, the main man around here. Verse 39, And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. This is speaking of the crucifixion of Christ. And when the Lord, therefore, the vineyard uh, cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And look what they answered. He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let his vineyard out to other husbandmen who shall render him fruits in their season. Well, that's the only logical answer, and that's exactly what happened. And that's where we come in. You see, we are the other ones. He had a job he wanted to do. What was that job? To tell the whole world about a gracious God. Whose job was it to do that? Israel's job. They didn't do it. So he gave the task to somebody else. Who was that? Us. How are we doing? Verse 42. Jesus said unto them, Did you ever read in the Scriptures? And then he's uh, quoting here from the Old Testament, from Isaiah. I believe this is Isaiah 29, 16. Did you ever read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Now, if you've read much from the Bible in the way of uh, figurative language, you know that the stone is Jesus. In Daniel, he says, there's going to be a great kingdom, and then a stone is going to crush that kingdom. And uh, then uh, from that stone is another great kingdom going to come. Well, this stone is Christ, speaking of his second coming. You see, uh, to the nations of the world, he's the smiting stone. He's going to smite the nations during the time we call the Great Tribulation. To the nation of Israel, he's the stumbling stone. That is to say, they stumbled over the fact that he came meek and lowly. They didn't want a king. He to come prancing in on a white horse with a sword in his hand and ready to defeat the Roman Empire 
well, they would have followed him. They didn't want his kind of God. They didn't want uh, someone coming in humility to pay for their sins first. You've got to acknowledge your sinner before you can want somebody to pay for your sins. And that's why most people never be saved. They don't want anybody to pay for their sins because they don't want to acknowledge that they're that sinful, that they need that. And that's the big reason people don't get saved. And this is what Israel didn't want. They didn't want to acknowledge that they need someone to come lowly. And uh, so he, they stumbled over the stone. And see, the stone over which they stumbled became the foundation stone upon which the church is built. The songwriter saw that. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, neither is there any other foundation, Paul says. See, he is the foundation stone. So, the the uh, stumbling stone has become the cornerstone, the foundation stone. And then one day, it this stone will be the smiting stone. So he's the stumbling stone to the nation of Israel, past tense. He's the foundation stone to the church, present tense. And he's the smiting stone to the uh, Gentile powers of the world, as prophesied in Daniel, future tense. So we might say... Uh, this stumbling stone speaks of his earthly ministry. The foundation stone speaks of his present ministry, and the smiting stone speaks of his future ministry. So did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken away, taken away from you, that is the nation of Israel, and given to a nation, that's us, bringing forth fruits uh, of it, and whatsoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. Shall be the smiting stone. Uh, shall be smitten by the stone. But on whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. I suppose we ought to find that place in Daniel in just a moment so you can see where the reference comes from. And when the chief priest and the Pharisees had heard these his parables, they perceived that he spoke of them. They, they're really bright, weren't they? They got the point. But that didn't make them repent. And when they sought to lay hands on him, they were going to kill him for, for talking about him that way. They feared the multitude because the multitude, that is, took him for a prophet. And, of course, when Stephen preached the same thing, he said about the same thing there only in plainer words. In Acts chapter 7, they did stone him to death, didn't they? Let's look up this scripture in Daniel 2.34. Uh, the Bible lesson's over, and you, those of you that want to can go. The rest of us are going to look up this verse right here. 2, let's look at, to start with 2.31. Daniel is interpreting a vision for King Nebuchadnezzar, and he's going to make a prophecy. Thou, O king, sawest and beheld a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form of it was terrible. This image's head was of gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of brass, its legs of iron, its feet of part iron and part clay thou sawest, until a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon its feet that were of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. The, uh, then were the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away and no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. See, here's our figurative word mountain that we were referring to before. The stone, Jesus Christ, is going to become the seat of government a government that would fill, will fill the whole earth. So this is talking about that time when Christ in power will come and destroy all the nations of this world. Now you say, well, what's going to happen to me? Well, if you're one that belongs to the Lord, if you've received Christ as your Savior, you will have already been in heaven at least seven years when he comes to smite the nations. You'll be very safe uh, under his wings. In fact, you'll come with him on the expedition. And you won't have to do much, but you'll have a grandstand seat, and it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. So uh, uh, don't worry about yourself. 
if you've taken rest in Christ Jesus, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, I wonder if there's somebody here that, that has considered these parables and all of this message, and you, you can see that, that it's figurative language, and you can tell that Jesus is talking about something future. You're not real sure what we're talking about. But you see that there's something here, and you don't quite understand it, and you want to understand it. Well, you're not in a position to really understand it until you are born into the family of God. And that's why Jesus said, ye must be born again. That is to say, you've been born one time into this world, but the life you received at that birth will not take you through death. And you need to be born with a life that will transcend death. You need to be, have a life uh, that will go right through death and out the other side. That's a spiritual life. And it's going to be a very exciting life, and you're going to be in on all this excitement. And if you haven't been born again, you must be born again. Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How do I get to be born again? I say, God, I want to come to you your way. Now, the reason you're permitted to do that is because Jesus Christ lived a perfect life for you on this earth. And he died a death to pay any sin debt you might owe to God whatsoever. He did that already. And he did it for you, and he had you in mind. So what you do, since he's provided a way, you may not understand the way, but he's provided a way. You believe that God loves you, and it's provided a way to himself. And you talk to God, and you say, God, I want to come to you your way. And I'll assure you, you will have a life insurance policy until you understand it, because God has never let anybody die and go to hell yet that sincerely wanted to come to him his way, but just didn't quite understand. So you talk to God about that. In a minute, we're going to all bow our heads, and we're going to have a word of prayer. And uh, if, if you're not sure you've been born into the family of God, and you don't quite know how to do it, I'll tell you what to do tonight. Just say, God, with all my heart, I want to come to you your way. If you pray to God like that and you really are sincere about wanting to come to God God's way, he won't let you die. And he won't let the communists drop the atom bomb until he's given you an opportunity to understand very clearly what he has in mind is coming to you. Now, would you believe that? Would you believe that there's a God that loves you and has a way to himself? Let's talk to him right now. Dear God, we thank you that you loved us and provided a way unto yourself. And we know, God just based on the, the wonderful, exciting way that you've written this book. We know that you have a wonderful, great future for us. And we pray just now, if there's anybody here that has not found that way to you, that even now they'd speak to you about that and come to you. We pray for them. Now, with our heads bowed, if you're not sure that you've come to God his way, why don't you talk to him now? He's waiting. He'll listen. Just, just say, God, in the quietness of your own heart, God, I want to come to you your way. I want to know the way to my God. Be quiet a minute while you consider that and speak to your God. Lord, we thank you again for your marvelous word and those that have an interest in what you say. In Jesus' name, amen.